William H. White is an urbanist and is the mentor of a project for public spaces because of his seminar work and the study of human behavior in urban settings. For nearly two decades, White has been observing how people use streets and public spaces. Although City is about the design and management of urban spaces, White's true fascination is with the life and rituals of people out on the streets. For him, the street is a stage. In his article about the social life of the street, White talks about the different aspects that are related to how people move around the city, specifically in New York, which is basically where he lives. Here he talks about street behavior, street conversations, and the like. In the first part of the article, White talks about street conversations. Here he shares an experiment that he did with his research team, which required them to focus time-lapse cameras on several street corners and recorded the activity for two weeks. On maps of the corners, they plotted the location of each conversation and how long it lasted. And to screen out people who were only waiting for the light to change, they noted only those conversations lasting a minute or longer. The results of the activity were not at all as expected. Even White didn't expect it, as it showed that people who stopped to talk did not move out of the pedestrian flow, and if they had been out of it, they'd moved into it. He observed that most of the conversations were smack in the middle of the pedestrian flow, which is also known as the 100% location. So the question now is, why do most people choose to engage in conversations in the middle of a crowded area? Well, according to observers in other countries, they have noted that we have the tendency to self-congest ourselves. Self-congestion. According to Matthew Kulek, who's a dude who has a weird fetish for shopping centers, the great majority of people were found to select their sites for social interaction right on or very close to the traffic lines intersecting the plaza. Relatively few people form their gatherings away from the spaces used for navigation. But that's enough about Kiolek. In White's article, he also states that the best places to look at people for his study are street corners. As a general rule, 100% conversations are spotted most often at the busiest crossroads locations. 5th Avenue at 50th Street is one such. The heaviest pedestrian flows are at the entrance to the Saks Department Store and at the street corner. Over 133 conversations, White was able to map out, after several days, that 57% were concentrated in the highest traffic locations. And while there were no significant differences between men and women, men did tend to talk somewhat longer than women. 50% of male groups talked 5 minutes or longer compared to 45% of female groups. In another part of White's article, he said that one of the most notable social rituals is schmoozing. Schmoozing is a Yiddish term for which there is no precise definition. It means nothing talk political opinion, sports talk, but not, so they say, business talk. Basically, it means idle gossip. According to White, based on his observations, almost all New York garment district schmoozers are men. There are two kinds of characteristics of schmoozers. First one is that schmoozers are fairly consistent in choosing locations. They show a liking for well-defined spaces. Take, for example, the edge of the curb, or a ledge. The second characteristic would be the consistency in the duration of their sessions, which will be either fairly brief or fairly long. Speech. According to White, the back and forth movements of street encounters have their parallel in speech. Frida Goldman Eisler, who is a professor at the University College of London, has found that in spontaneous speech, 40% to 50 is silence. In relation to the previous statement, we can now say that gestures aid speech. Gestures reinforce the speech and the pauses. A person may pause for effect and then add an uh or an um to signal that he's going to go on again. It is obvious enough that gestures help one person communicate with another. 
whatever the function of the gestures and movements, the street is a congenial place for the expression of them. Large cities versus small cities. White states that in smaller cities, densities tend to be lower, pedestrians move at a slower pace, and there is less of the social activity in high traffic areas. Pedestrians in the great metropolitan centers, on the other hand, act more like one another than pedestrians in smaller cities in their respective countries. Tokyo and New York are examples. The linear development characteristic of Japanese cities is quite unlike the grid pattern of American cities, and the cultural differences are enormous. But when you get people out on the street, the pedestrians of the two cities behave very much the same. According to White, the people of great cities should act alike is not surprising. They are responding to high density situations and to a range of stimuli not found in smaller cities. It is at once the boon and the bane of smaller cities that they are not crowded. But similarities of behavior between cities, large or small, are more significant than the differences. In considering plans for new civic spaces, people often fret themselves into inaction over the thought of obsolescence. If we design for today's people, they ask, how do we know it will work a generation or so hence? You can't know, of course. But the fact that is that spaces, designed to work very well for their initial constituency, usually work very well for later ones, and indeed, help define them. Mm -hmm.